We're going to try to compete with the noise that's outside, but that's okay. I'm very excited to see the amount of people here at 6.30, your champions. Thank you for showing up and for supporting this event. This then means that, of course, all of you are very much um, appreciate the topic of youth and of land rights. And so my hope is that we can have a wonderful discussion today, um, get to tough questions, but also good solutions from the room as well. It's important. This event is being organized by the Food Systems Pavilion Youth Co-host. Raise your hand, those that are part of the Youth Co-host. Amazing. We are 13 youth-led organizations that are part of this youth co-host. And the idea was really to come together from different geographic regions, um, to share perspectives, and coming from different angles, whether that's forestry, agriculture, nature, and climate, with the goal to join forces and really put food systems not only on the agenda, but really from a youth perspective as well. Nothing about us without us. That's usually what we like to say. And so the topic of land is also quite important, not only from a youth perspective, but also from the perspective of farmers as well. We like to separate the topics into two, the youth constituency, the farmers constituencies, but a lot of farmers are young people. <laughs> and so it's important to be able to have these kind of conversations, these discussions, they're tough ones, but I imagine that all of you here today are ready for that. Now we have a wonderful, a wonderful uh, panel, panelists here, experts on the topic. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the setup. I'm going to introduce our wonderful moderator. After that, we're going to have the first round of panelists who are really going to set the scene from different perspectives, from a farmer's perspective, from an indigenous youth perspective, and also from an international um, intergovernmental organization perspective. We're then going to have a second panel that's really going to focus on key players when we're talking about the, uh, agri food systems, but also land. We're going to have speakers from Agra, from Bayer, and from SNV to really give various perspectives on the topic. We're then going to open the floor for interventions. And so here I ask for you all to ask questions that are constructive and that will allow us all to be able to find solutions or ideas of what could be potential ways of partner partnering um, and having good collaboration. So now to introduce our first speaker, our first uh, our moderator, we have Dana Lynn Swaby. Dana Lynn Sw uh, Swaby is a member of the Jamaica Network of Rural Women Producers and a world, uh, from the World's Farmers Organization's third edition Genevesian student. A development communication specialist, she has developed and supported several agricultural development projects for farming groups in Jamaica. In her professional and volunteer roles, she has developed and supported several youth-led engagement campaigns, research and outreach projects on a local and international level. Now, I connected with her just a couple of days ago, and I'm blown away with her knowledge, with the way that she speaks. So I couldn't be more thrilled to have a fantastic, um, not only Caribbean representation as well, a Latin American representation, but such a wonderful uh, person as well. So without, really, come over. Without further ado, please give a round of applause to Dana Lynn. Thank you, Glindis, for that kind introduction. And also to big up, as we say in Jamaica, which is to highlight my Caribbean heritage or background. That's something I'm really proud of in this large microcosm of the world at COP28. Is really happy to have representation from all, I don't know if it's four, is it four corners of the globe or all corners of the globe? That's sometimes we say that. All right, so let me get an energy check right now. I know uh, Glindy said it's the end of day, but we don't want to see anyone nodding off in this uh, in this room. So how's the energy level? How's it? How's your... That is so awesome. So thank you uh, so much again. As you would have mentioned, I am here in the capacity of uh, the gymnasium student as part of the World Farmers Organization. And I am really, really privileged to be here. And I'm very happy that we're having this kind of conversation because over the past few days, being here at COP with my colleagues, we've been diving into this very issue, youth and access to land. We've been dissecting it. And it was really a privilege and very important for us to, to share the country experiences, seeing the similarity between the African context, the Caribbean context, and other regions as we recognize that 
this is a very critical resource that is a catalyst for advancing sustainable agriculture. So without further ado, I really want to thank the speakers that we have here and we are very much looking forward to their contributions and of course the insights from the audience. So it's my privilege at this time to let you know who we have before you. Starting with Richard Kanchung. Richard Kanchung is a co-founder of the Young Emerging Farmers Initiative, YEFI. It is an award-winning initiative and, he, and also the 2023 Equator Prize where he is the executive director. He has trained over 10,000 youth across the country on sustainable production, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, business, entrepreneurship, and leadership in the food system. He has mentored over 2,000 young people and provided them with business development services, especially those wanting to start a business or already doing business in the food system. He is an Obama leader, a global change maker awardee, an Ubuntu leader, a climate reality leader, a United People Global Sustainability leader, a 2022 Zanaka Youth Award recipient, as well as a 2022 Ban Ki-moon Agri Champion in Africa. He is also a 2023 Max Abiso Ed Kids Climate Ambassador and a 2023 CX CXC change maker. Wow, you maybe should be cop president. <laughs> All right, uh, give a round of applause, please, for Richard Kanchun. And now we move to Saraya Mangawa. Saraya is a climate youth negotiator and advocate from the island of New Way, located in the South Pacific Ocean. Her current profession is a media journalist in New Way's only media industry. Saraya studied a bachelor's in politics and Pacific studies at the University of Auckland. She is an indigenous youth of New Way and the Pacific. Saraya feels strongly about empowering young people to make more ambitious actions towards paving the way for our future. Rounding off the panel, we have Juan Carlos Mendoza. Juan Carlos Mendoza is Director of EFAD's Environment, Climate, Gender, and Social Inclusion Division. He is responsible for overseeing EFAD's strategy to increase rural people's resilience to climate change and promote development that champions women, youth, and indigenous peoples as agents of change. Before joining EFAD, Mendoza worked in multiple international organizations, including Managing Director of the Global Mechanism of the United Nations Convention on Desertification and was responsible for coordinating KPMG's work with multilateral development banks and international organizations. Now, audience, I have to inject some balance because I, do, I don't remember if I, I for, uh, if I encourage you to give a round of applause for Soraya. So now that we have two in one, you're going to have to do it like a shampoo and conditioner. So make sure that it's really, <laughs> it's really vibrant, please. A round of applause for all our panelists to make them welcome. Now, before we dive into the actual discussion, as, as Glendis would have uh, explained previously, we have a very dynamic arrangement where we have two rounds of speakers. We know there's much to be said from everyone, but at the same time, I want to invite our panelists to be mindful of the five-minute allocation for your response so that we can transition to the next segment and also honor the time commitment of our guests that we have here in the room. Thank you so much. Okay, so I, I want to... I want to direct uh, the question. Of course, we're here. We want to learn more about the current issue from your, hear your perspective on the current issue of land rights and youth access. And also tell us about your work or initiatives that you're using to find a solution to the problem. So we're going to ask each speaker their take on that question. And I'm going to begin with Richard. So how is your work and initiative furthering equitable land access for young people? Uh, thank you so much, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, that introduction. <laughs> All right. Um, Young Image, I think I'll just give a, a bit, just a snapshot of what my organization does. Uh, so Young Image Farmers Initiative uh, works with young people uh, in the food system. We have a very holistic and practical way of engaging young people in the food system. Uh, we help young people uh, through the food system by 
uh, providing development uh, support in terms of uh, business development, uh, as well as ensuring that we create ecosystems in the finance and markets as well. Yeah, so just to dive in into what uh, the question uh, is asking for. So I'll, I'll just look at this from three uh, areas and three points. Uh, firstly, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, land accessibility and ownership is very critical. I think that's one of our areas in our organization where we look at because we need to understand that young people have had challenges first and foremost to access land and this limited to access to this land has been based on either a land tenure system that might be ambiguous or no clear policies that are actually uh, giving opportunities for young people to have access to that particular land. We have also noticed that uh, there's inadequate uh, support in terms of resource. I think most young people cannot afford to buy land. And if you look at most land, it's prime land, it might be expensive, and they do not have the capacity to do so. And that's one of the other challenges that we've noticed in the work that we do in our country. And then we also noticed that uh, land tenure system insecurities, because we find that most of the times, you, in the aspect of, or in the absence of any clear policies, uh, youth, first challenges where even their land can be grabbed in, in, in long term and that also causes challenges for them to actually even look at considering going to the, in the space itself. We have had some success uh, in our program where we, we've noted that communities have been engaged where uh, we've developed uh, situations where communities are able to work together to talk to their traditional leaders and come up with programs that uh, traditional leaders are able to help them to uh, access this land and this has also resulted in them uh, looking at innovative ways of engaging in the food system and uh, sustainable production aspect are easy to actually engage when they are aware about it. And then we've noticed that the importance of land tenure, uh, la uh, security land sec um, uh, rights for, for uh, young people is that there's, there's going to be stability as well as uh, it's easy for young people to actually invest in long-term investments because if a young person has ownership of land, they'll be thinking long-term. And it's actually easier for them to either get credit for that land, uh, access resource. Uh, planning is long-term because they know anytime, no one will just show up and say, no, can you leave this land and so forth. So it's very, very important. Uh, and the sustainable agriculture is easier to promote when you know that uh, you own the land. You are able to test any uh, things that are new and just try out whatever that is coming. But if you don't have ownership to land, it's very difficult for you to even try to test. You'd want to just focus on making profits or trying to see how you can earn in that particular uh, space, depending on what you're doing anyway. Uh, so land rights have also enabled communities to be empowered uh, because uh, when you, they are the owners of that land, uh, it's easy for them to work as a community and think of any innovative ways of actually engaging that particular uh, uh, undertaking. Could be crop production and so forth. We've also noted the impact on sustainable agriculture. I think we've noticed that this has fostered innovation or innovative agriculture practices as well as contributed to the food security. In our, one of our programmings, we realized that communities were empowered, like I highlighted, but it was also important to also highlight the fact that we were able to uh, identify and seeing that communities were able to preserve their heritage because they own that land. It's very easier for them in as much as you're bringing uh, technology, it's easier to also include indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Greetings and in my language from New Air. I'd like to thank Dana for the beautiful introduction uh, for each and every one of us. But uh, to be honest, I feel like the odd one out. I don't have as much prestigious uh, and uh, very great leadership roles and experience as uh, the two here besides me. So I commend them both. Um, but let's not waste any time on uh, thanking um, everyone. Um, 
just a just a quick question. Who here knows or have heard of or has been to Niue? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, just just like three minutes ago, yeah. Um, well, uh, it's not surprising. Everyone that I meet here at COP uh, have no idea where Niue is. And just before I go on a little bit into the question, where I come from, storytelling is very important in the way that we share our stories, our knowledge, and our experiences. So I just want to brief you a little bit about Niue. Uh, Niue is a small island nation, but we are the largest raised coral atoll in the world, located in the South Pacific Ocean. We have a population of 1,700 people, so I'm pretty sure we're the smallest in this COP um, so far. Um, our culture is Niuean, our mother tongue is Niuean. And our economy, we heavily rely on aid from New Zealand um, because uh, we are a self-governing nation in free association with New Zealand since 1974. So 50 years next year will be a big milestone for us. Um, but yes, our economy relies on uh, New Zealand's aid um, as well as tourism and agriculture uh, plays an important part uh, for our economic development. So those are just some brief points that I wanted to bring up about uh, where I come from. Another reason why I feel like I'm the odd one out here is because I don't have much experience in the agricultural sector or in terms of the farmers initiatives or any other way I would say. As mentioned, I'm a media journalist and I I've briefed um, my fellow peers here that I do cover everything, climate change, politics, arts, you name it, and even um, our agriculture sector. So for me, uh, as an indigenous youth, land is life. Where I come from in the Pacific, new land is our culture, our livelihood, our way of life. And I feel the same. Uh, I think that's the same with everyone. Without land, uh, where are we to be? Where is our home? Who are we? So my biggest question or my biggest uh, vision and purpose being here is to learn from you, from the initiatives and solutions that everyone can contribute to us. Because as a, as a young person, um, there is not much interest of our young people in taking up uh, job opportunities or being involved in the agricultural sector. It is, it is something that has been part of our life. It is something that is just there. It, we, it's not something that we're interested in. And I, I just want to share a little bit of a story as well. Growing up, uh, I'm a daughter to a local farmer. And uh, he's a hardworking man, diligent man. And he always loves going to the, to the um, plantation. Otherwise, we call it the bush. And every morning and evening, he, he's always waking me up in the morning and evening calling me in. And for me, I don't like going to the bush. I don't like going to the plantation. And that's me growing up in primary school and high school. It feels like a chore. It's not something that I'm interested in doing because it's hard work. It, it takes a lot of physical labor. And as a woman, every other country, you know, women shouldn't be uh, exerting themselves in physical labor outside of the house. So uh, for us, it's a normal part of life. And that's how we were raised. And as a young person now, when I left home and I went overseas to study, and I read, and during that time, it made me really think about how important uh, our way of life is and growing up. And it made me really, really acknowledge and, and realize I am too privileged, or maybe, yeah, yeah, I'm too privileged because I have these opportunities uh, that a lot of other youth in the world and other countries do not have. So for me, I am grateful to be here to be able to learn from everyone and share the knowledge and opportunities and experiences that we have. Um, I may not be able to offer solutions, but I'm here to advocate for my people, my, uh, my Pacific, and uh, for me as an Indigenous youth. Thank you. My time is up. Yes, you have the floor, Juan Carlos. Thank you very much. And I, I do think I'm the uh, odd person out just because I'm not a representative of the youth, unfortunately. But I do have the privilege of working uh, with young people. And actually, maybe to answer the question, let me start by sharing with you some of the things that we hear from young people. Actually, in IFA, we conducted a global survey amongst uh, young people from rural areas about what are the obstacles, so why are they not engaged in farming? And I think the, the first one is really what Saraya uh, mentioned lack of attractiveness of farming, or at least farming as they saw their parents do it. It's a back-breaking 
line of work. I think some, I must confess, sometimes us members of international organizations sometimes idealize it, but in reality, it's, it is tough work. Um, the second one is there's a lot of uh, population and land degradation pressures that are making that, so that particularly in the um, sub-Saharan Africa, the plots of land that youth could inherit are becoming smaller and smaller and in more marginal uh, quality of land. So it is really not economically viable in many cases for them to engage in agriculture. The third issue is it's related to women. All this is much worse for women. In general, um, uh, young women are about uh, half, the, the chance, the probability of them having land titles about half that for young men. Um, we looked into, into this in different countries. Many times it's, it's very context specific to uh, customary practices and the, there's always the challenge of, of how to find a way to address uh, that. And then the fourth obstacle that we hear from youth is, look, at, we want to be part of the political dialogue. They feel that there's very little engagement of the youth when making agricultural policies. And increasingly, in many countries, agricultural policies is made um, in the context of a single concern, which is how we increase production. When in reality, there's many uh, other issues, including, for example, what's happening to the social fabric of, of rural communities, including uh, youth. So I'll go very quickly uh, with some examples of things that we're doing, and it's not something that IFA is doing. We're helping the countries uh, do it because you, for, a com for an issue as complex as this, ju youth involvement in agriculture and land rights, you need to look at, at different types of solutions. The first one is intergenerational transfer. We cannot wait for youth to inherit land when their parents die. Yeah, we need to start working with them. With this is called as a technical uh, term for this, called intervivos uh, transfers, and that is we start. We are working particularly in Senegal and and, and Liberia with farmers organizations to help farmers as they start getting older to pair with youth farmers so that the transition to the next generation of farming uh, takes place uh, more smoothly. Another mechanism is sharecropping. I mean, sharecropping does not, not need to be a negative thing. Sharecropping can allow uh, youth farmers to rent land and start, and this eventually leads to uh, them also owning land. And I think one example that I like in particular is something we're doing in Ethiopia where we have um, women who have inherited land that for many reasons cannot directly exploit it themselves to be paired with youth farmers who rent uh, the land from them. So this helps both sides. The women become uh, economically empowered and, and the youth have um, land to work on. There's a lot of a third area is allocation of communal land. We are working in several countries, like in the Gambia, to make sure that uh, to help them establish programs that help spare uh, allocations of communal land, which is very common into uh, towards youth. And then the last one is there are situations like we work in Indonesia where what the youth need is access to credit to buy or rent land. So this is something that we are also helping uh, many countries do. So let me just stop there with some of uh, the different solutions that we need for a, a, a complex uh, problem. Thanks. Thank you. Testing? OK, great, thanks. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists for that, for those insightful contributions. And I want to circle back to you, Soraya. We are all in this together. At the end of the day, if we have 80,000 people here at COP, it can't be the 80,000 people who care about climate action and sustainable agriculture. So I do think your contributions were valid. We need everybody at the table. As a journalist, you get to ask the questions and to push the agenda in a very different way. So your views, your presence, and your, your care and concern is very much welcome in this space. Uh, a lot of issues coming out. Uh, we, we, saw, we, we see clearly the significance of land in terms of cultural preservation and, her and the preservation of heritage. And also, I loved what uh, Richard touched on, the need, the issue of land tenure and how that system has been set up and the, the call. So someone told me to, to change the things into a positive. So when we realize there's insufficient, so you mentioned about no clear policies for enabling access. So definitely it shows a call to action that we 
need to revise these policies to make them clearer, um, to enable access for youth. Uh, we also spoke about um, the empowerment of communities through the work that you've been doing, Richard. And I think that um, pair, blending that with, with what Juan Carlos also mentioned about pairing youth farmers to promote intergenerational transfer of ownership. And if you plug what Richard is doing as it relates to building business capacity, that can also solve this issue. Now that you have access to land, how is it that we make it profitable? How is it that we achieve the sustainability? And it's not like there is this race, you know, to get the profits that you need. So many things, the issue of access to credit, something that is also heavily discussed. So I, I do invite you all to continue the conversation with our panelists as they will now blend with the audience and we're gonna make the transition. So give them a round of applause once more. They have just set the context to a very important conversation. So we're gonna invite you to, to mingle and mix with us as we make way for our second round of speakers in this segment. Thank you. So we're gonna do a, oh, for me it's anti-clockwise. Yes. <laughs> okay. As we make welcome our second panelist, and this segment, it's the hot seat. So our first speakers, plural, did so well in setting the context and sharing country, cultural, and local perspectives for us. And now we move next. So I start, with the, in I start the introductions with Simon. Simon O'Connell is the CEO of SNV, a mission-driven global development partner working in more than 20 countries across Africa and Asia. With a team of over 1,600 people, SNV strengthens capacities and catalyzes partnerships that transform the agri-food, energy, and water systems. With over 25 years' experience working for social change in a wide array of countries and contexts, and having spent much of his career living and working in fragile and volatile environments, Simon O'Connell is passionate about enabling sustainable and more equitable, sorry, equitable lives for all. I'm going to move along. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jennifer Kroll. Jennifer is a global head of partnerships, growers engagement, and agri-chain activation at Bayer Crop Science. She and her team are responsible for deepening Bayer's work with global growers networks, the next generation of agriculture leaders, grain traders, and the feed sector to drive the transformation of sustainable agriculture. Before coming to Bear, Jennifer led the public affairs unit for a family-owned pork producer. Jamaicans would love that. Prior to that, she worked for nine years at the International Republican Institute, designing and evaluating assistance programs and empowering local actors around the globe to engage their governments with posts in Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, as well as the headquarters in Washington, D.C. And rounding off our panelists in the hot seat, we have His Excellency Haile Mariam Dessalen. His Excellency Haile Mariam Dessalen is the former Prime Minister of the Federal Democratic of the Republic of Ethiopia and is also the Chairperson of Agra Board of Directors and Chair of AGRF Partners Group. His Excellency was the second Executive Prime Minister of Ethiopia who served from August 2012 following the death of Prime Minister Mele Zenawi until his resignation and handover to his successor in April 2018. Previously, he served as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Social Affairs Minister and Government Chief Whip Minister under Prime Minister Mele Zenawi. He also served as governor of the Southern Regional State for six years. He is the first leader in modern Ethiopian history to step down voluntarily, setting the state for sweeping reform. With annual economic growth rates over 10% during his tenure as prime minister, he viewed his resignation as vital in conducting reforms that would lead to sustainable peace and democracy. After leaving office, Haile Mariam co-founded and is a chairperson of the Haile Mariam and Roman Foundation. Audience, please, again, welcome our panelists for the hot seat. And now, since it's a hot seat, the first heated question goes to Simon. 
global youth growth trajectory is on the rise. Resources are increasingly being scarce. Digital innovation is impacting global financing modalities. What are your views on development aid utilization and what's needed to make it sustainable and realize impact at scale? Great, no, I've got the microphone, so it's great to be with you. Thank you, Dana Lynn, for injecting such energy into the room. I have to tell you all, um, I was a little bit apprehensive Coming, I've been in this room for much of the day. I, I've been at COP for uh, about a week now, so a lot of sessions, a lot of panels, um, et cetera. And this one, I was racking my brain before I was, or as I was getting ready to come in here, I've got some notes on my phone, and I put my phone away because I was scribbling furiously as you three were speaking, and Richard in particular at the, at the beginning. Um, so I've changed what I was going to say, and I hope that's okay. Uh, on the back of your great remarks. Um, and I did that because this is a, a really complicated topic. My organization and in my past, I've been lucky enough to be involved in um, many, many youth-focused programs for many years, including in Ethiopia and its relatively large scale. We're reaching around 440,000 people now with access to jobs with support of the... MasterCard Foundation and uh, the Swedish development agency, CEDA. But it's not good enough, frankly, because within the context of Ethiopia, as you'll know, uh, Your Excellency, two million young people are entering the labor market every single year. So what we're grappling with is an issue of scale. Actually, um, somebody earlier today told me it's, it's not a youth bulge, it's a youth quake that is happening. You take countries like Uganda, where the average age is somewhere between 17 and 18 years old. And oftentimes that's framed as uh, a bulge or a problem, but actually there's a massive, massive opportunity. And as um, Juan Carlos, Carlos, you, you, you just said, there's a huge opportunity in agriculture, but we need to recognize still that we've got further to go in really attracting young people or enabling others to attract them is probably a better way of putting it into the agriculture sector. And the big, big barrier is indeed this issue of land tenure. I've been lucky enough to spend time in probably 40 countries in Africa. I lived in many over many years. And the issue of land tenure, whether you're in uh, Zimbabwe, or whether, whether you're in more um, uh, agro-pastoralist environments in the Sahel and all the complexity there, the issue of land tenure is a huge one. So what do we need to do about that? Dana Lynn, I hope I can just give a few kind of concrete recommendations. I'm not sure, to, to, to be honest, what we're doing with the time allocations, but I'll be as brief as I can. It's about finance, right? It's about finance, about getting the right tranches of financing with the right risk mechanisms through to young people. And the challenge here is you're talking about pretty small ticket sizes, pretty small amounts of financing. So what lender, what, what lender is going to lend on to a group who are going to lend on to another group who are going to lend on to another group who lends down into that very small ticket size to those young people who need to take a loan so that they can buy land? That's the first bit, yeah? Then you need to understand the context. And frankly, there are so many policies around land tenure in so many countries around the world. But working, and we have learnings um, around this from SMV, from our work in the Sahel, are around how you work with customary institutions. Not all those big lofty policy frameworks, but really working with those more traditional, long-standing, deeply historic customary institutions. And we found some leverage and some opportunities to get access to land for young people if you do that. Access to land, you need cadastering, yeah? You need to know the land. You need to understand who it has belonged to historically, who it currently belongs to, and what the opportunities are to then either divide up that land or move it under a different ownership. And of course, we've got fabulous digital tools and technologies that can enable that. Um, and we also need to understand that there are huge barriers to certain segments of society, agro-pastoralists, 
How do you figure out owning land for them when they're on the move? Your transhumans corridors and the rights around them are being eroded increasingly and particularly for young people in the Sahel. And then for young women, we can't sit in discussions like this talking about land access for young people without acknowledging the huge disparities. You kindly referenced my passion for equitable opportunities for all. That means young women in particular. We can't just say we're going to be gender sensitive. We can't just say we're going to be mainstreaming gender into our programs. We need to be truly and explicitly intentional and gender responsive when we talk about generating opportunities for young people and young women in particular. I'm told I need to stop. I'm sorry, you brought me back into the lecture room. So thank you so much, <laughs> Simon. I just snagged that last point, being gender responsive over being gender sensitive. Uh, so true. And now we move over to the second, well, I guess we're working our way back. The second person in the hot seat, Jennifer. How is Bayer addressing the challenges faced by young and small scale farmers in gaining access to land in an agriculture in an agricultural landscape that is increasingly dominated by large corporations. Thanks, Dana Lynn, for the question, and thanks for the invitation to, to join you all. Um, I, and thanks to, to the panelists that went before. I think you guys provided a great, great landscape, and uh, it's an honor to be up here with, with Your Excellency and, and with you, Simon. So I think, you know, youth engagement is key and critical here. So we at Bear have been supporting youth leadership and youth stepping into these decision-making spaces, primarily through like the WFO gymnasium program. So we were the initial uh, sponsor of that program with WFO and have been working with them for six years to get more youth engaged and sitting at the table. We also look at the role that we have to play in, in policy and in advocacy in these spaces. So as a company, we work on inputs, whether that's seeds, whether that's crop protection, or whether that's a digital tool for farmers. So on the land access issue, this is imperative for our customers to have access to that land. And Richard, something you said really struck me as we look at land use, right? So if it's just access to land for a short period of time, the incentive for that farmer is to get a profit out of the land and to move on to the next piece of land, because that rent or that access is limited. So I think this land tenure, this succession is imperative and key here and somewhere that we need to look. The issue of women access to land is something that we're also looking at from a policy perspective. Whether that's being able to inherit the land or even being able to own land. And whether that's instituted in policy and key institutional barriers or whether that's more of a cultural barrier. So I'm from the United States, if you couldn't tell by my accent here. Um, and I come from an ag community. And the expectation for years is that the land would go to the oldest son, right? That's the expectation. And that's shifting. We're seeing a change in the demographic in the United States. Now reports are that 50% of the land decision makers and the decision makers on the farm are women. We're seeing enrollment at ag universities fundamentally shift. We're seeing the same shift happening in Brazil. So I think this youth coming up, we're going to see more women engaged, so we can't look at that enough um, as we're looking at our customers in the future and the decision making that they bring forward. When we look at smallholder farmers, I think we all know that the majority of smallholder farmers are women. And the dynamic there is as diverse as every plot of land where they, where they live and work. The decision making is different. The problem set is different when we're looking about not just access to land, but access to finance, as you say, that becomes key and critical. So from our perspective, who can we partner with to de-risk, to look at opportunities for capital investment up front and that capital lending to happen for the farmer to have that flow of cash needed for inputs. And so, is, is it happening perfectly? No, but I think partnership is key here. So we're looking at partnering with different financial institutions, with different policy institutions, and then making sure that young people have a seat at the decision-making table and aren't sidelined into a side conversation, right? They say, oh, well, we have a youth committee. Okay, that's a great start, okay? And now, who's pulling up the seat for the youth at the table and with the youth, or who's moving aside to pull the chair up there. And I think that's key and imperative is that decision-making process happening. 
and I'm done with 30 seconds to spare. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. And now we move over to His Excellency. Uh, it's rounding off the hot seat, so I think the mic might, might be very hot at this moment. So when, <laughs> <laughs> when Agri was founded in 2006, the main vision was to increase agricultural yields as well as profit by enabling small-scale farmers to access fertilizer <coughs> and seeds. Now, 17 years later, we still see the rampant food security in the region with increasing environmental costs. How is Agra addressing the problem of unsustainable land use and decreasing seed sovereignty? Um, thank you very much. First of all, Agra was established to replicate the green revolution we have seen in India and China. Um, the, it, was, it was established by you know, the former Secretary General Kofi Annan and some African leaders. Uh, to understand what the problem is with Africa while other continents are revolutionizing their agricultural uh, productivity. Uh, we do understand the problems of green revolution in those uh, continents, uh, but we said uniquely African green revolution, which takes care of environment at the center. Uh, but that was, you know, initially, we focused on productivity increment through technologies by deploying something like 600 PhDs were trained uh, in, the, in the first phase with PhD in breeding and agronomy and agroeconomics, which are entirely technical things. And after 10 years, we understood that this is not enough. I mean, for productivity increment, we need some other inputs into the system. So we have a number of systemic bottlenecks that has to be addressed in agricultural and food systems. So in this regard, we came to understand that if governments are not at the driving seat, this transformation cannot happen. Again, if the private sector is not an engine of that grows, it doesn't happen. So with this, we introduced government capacity building, we call it state capacity building, and policy advocacy relationship with governments into the existing seed systems and uh, you know, productivity increment. So that has brought us some distance, but we also knew in, the, in between that Africa uniquely is a young continent with like 70% below the age of 30, and most of the graduates are not going into agriculture. So what's going to happen to these young people? Because our people, livelihood is based in agriculture and we have to do something about it. So we did that. And I think with that, uh, in Agra, we introduced go-getters. Uh, some of the leaders are here. And in the, in the first phase, 1.5 million young people involved in agriculture, uh, but we came to understand that the policy issue on land tenure is one of the impediments for the young people to engage in agriculture. So now we are focusing on policy advocacy with the governments to introduce best practices everywhere in the globe, including in our African continent, to bring about guidelines that help governments to bring policy into uh, you know, the system. Otherwise, without the risking, of course, a comprehensive support, we cannot have young people engaged in agriculture. So with this, I think Agra in our next phase, uh, including sustainability issues, we will uh, go for policy and advocacy, changing policies that can help to the risk, uh, help young people engage in agriculture with all, uh, you know, ingredients. I think a comprehensive support, but land is the basic impediment for young people to engage in agricultural production. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency Haile Mariam. I just find it ironic as because we braced for the hot question and then I found the air, you know, had to cool that down. But uh, again, uh, we thank you for the insightful contributions. And in just a moment, we're going to segue to uh, the audience. So I hope if you have any questions that you had brewing, we're going to give you an opportunity to 
to pitch that or feed those questions um, to, to our panelists um, here. I was going to ask a question about the policy, because, uh, but I think in some parts you did answer that. Um, because I do think you know, that's always a critical conversation. And I recognize you mentioned that you are taking global examples and, and best practices to infuse in the country strategy. Uh, but also, what's the plan in relation to the inclusion of youth in shaping said policies? And actually, I mean, one of the one of the setbacks we have in policy formulation is the young people, women, are not involved. And without the owners involved in the policy making, I think that policy could not be easily implemented. If, 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 even though there is a good willingness from the government side to do that, I think we need to make them part and parcel of that formulation. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, do you have a point that you wanted to touch on? Sure. Definitely. D delighted to encourage to, you to build on. Um, yeah, responses. delighted to do so. Um, so maybe may, maybe three additional points. I think um, one is there's often this perception, perhaps valid in some contexts, but not everywhere. Frankly, that you need collateral to get that access to financing. Your Excellency, you might know we um, uh, are involved with the first non-collateralized lending mechanisms in Ethiopia, and you know what the the default rates are less than 2%, yeah? So this sort of myth sometimes out there that you shouldn't be able to access a loan if you don't have the collateral to back it up, I think that um, can perhaps be acknowledged. Secondly, if indeed you do require that collateral to get the loan, we're seeing some successes with the formation of association structures, and then the association can on-lend to young people. So the direct bigger loan doesn't need to go directly to those, those young people. I think that's probably scalable in a number of contexts. And then... Um, my last point would be, and I'm probably not, in fact, I am definitely not the right person to be sitting on a panel like this or even in the audience to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, but I think there is a danger that we have these kind of conversations very caught up in the immediate rather than thinking a few years down the line. Frankly, with AI, there are going to be massive opportunities on the gender front for women to work more in agriculture because the tools are coming that are gonna make some of that work um, much more manageable for young men and for young women. They're gonna provide different mechanisms for different ways to engage in the labor market around agriculture and um, it, we would all be doing well to think a little bit further into the future because the acceleration is coming. Thank you. Thank you so much um, uh, for that for that point. Uh, so I want to scuttle over to Jennifer and a follow up question. I, I love that you mentioned the WFO gymnasium as you know one of the strategies that Bayer has been using to engage youth. And as a part of that gymnasium, I really you know have been enjoying my experience and engaging with some of my other colleagues from, as I mentioned before, from across the globe, who we've distilled some of the very same issues that we are now dissecting. And the issue of land ownership, even on Monday, a very heated, not in a bad way, but very, well, in a hot seat type of way, discussion on land ownership. So I want to also ask, you know, what is the further strategy for Bayer to support gymnasium, not just gymnasium leaders, because we're a representative of other youth farmers, to create that enabling environment for land ownership because even now in the program we are distilling that this is a challenge this is a barrier so and i know that simon even mentioned some um, organization strategies as leveraging long-standing institutions you know to enable access so just wanted to ask what bears a um, more pointed or daggered approach to help young farmers you know create that environment so that they can also access our own land I look forward to hearing more about this hot debate that you all have been having. Um, so I, I, you know, I think, again, it's us looking at what our customers need, right? And if our customers, our next generation of customers are youth, what do they need and where can we step in and help them? And so I think it's a listening loop. So hearing what you all have been debating, love to hear your ideas. Um, I turn to young people of what's expected of us to help in that space, right? Understanding that our business is what our business is, but but what what are you guys expecting from buyer? Is it a partnership? 
Is it bringing in development institutions, partnering with finance? Is it looking at preferred, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of some programs that are ongoing where land owners have um, incentives to lease land to the next generation rather than staying on the farm f until they're unable to climb up into the tractor or work in the field themselves. So um, I think there's opportunities to, to listen about what's happening with Agra and Generation Africa, the go get us. And, and that's what I would say is right now, it's listening to what all you guys are talking about. Right. Well, in part, there is a, a take home assignment for me. And I'm, I know that my gymnasium colleagues would be happy to detail that. But even picking up on some of the, um, the tidbits that we've heard here, um, referencing, um, as, as Simon was mentioning, about the partnering with the long standing in institution. So, in the same way, we position youth as agents of change and change makers. And then we recognize the intergenerational collaboration that can happen with the decision makers. And we want to say the corporate influencers, if I may say. So there may be an opportunity um, after you know distilling the concerns, because we've, we've set the context. We know what the challenges are to land access and ownership. So for corporate uh, agriculture related entities, there is that opportunity to be the go between, to be the advocates for youth as well. And I'm sure you know that some, some development can come from that. So that's just off the bat to, to, to just respond to your question and then also say that I do commit to having that deeper. Uh, okay, so I've rounded off that segment of the follow-up, and I know, I know this is a highly anticipated moment where we'd love to hear from you, the audience, um, your feedback or your questions for the panelists at this time. Yes, I see a question here. Do we have the roving micro? Do you want me to? Thank you so much. So my question is for His Excellency Haile Mariam. And uh, previously in your intervention, you told that the productivity paradigm and green revolution narrative didn't work for the Agra previously. So as Agra board of chair of Agra board of directors, how, what is your vision for the future of Agra and farmers of sub-Saharan Africa, given that your initial mission was not achieved through its current initiative and structure? Thank you so much. All right, I think I didn't say Green Revolution didn't work, but it has its own setbacks. Uh, it, even in Asia, uh, Green Revolution has worked, but it has its own uh, drawbacks that has to be improved, especially on the environmental issues. So the productivity increment was there, but it's not enough. And we had, we paid a, a price in environmental deterioration, land degradation, and all kinds of those things. So now in our strategy, we put in place clearly that we need to go for conservation and the regenerative agriculture. Uh, and transitioning to that is not an easy job, but we have to try to go for that and make you know the climate smart agriculture as the basis for the next phase of agricultural development. We still see that there is a need for productivity increment. That's, that's absolutely necessary because with current amount of production we have, we cannot feed our people. But you know, Africa has 60% Arab land globally, which has not been utilized. But we have to be very conscious about how to utilize that land uh, with climate sensitive and uh, environmentally friendly ways. So that is our next, next step and next strategy to go about. So young people can play a major role in this regard. And there is a need for comprehensive support. I think land tenure system is only one, and, but basic. But there are a number of bottlenecks that the young people cannot engage in agriculture. And we have to address all those comprehensively, not just single out one or the other one. So I think this is very essential. Yes. Do we have another question? Any other question from the audience? No? Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm Flavio Antonelli from EAT Food. Uh, Great discussion, very inspiring. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, I was, there's one thing that stuck with me, which is the problem 
that I personally cannot really imagine a solution to, which is increasing the attractiveness of the profession. It was raised earlier. Um, and I'm, this is a question to all the speakers, really, if anyone has any um, thoughts on the matter of really how to tackle this issue. <laughs> you mentioned inter um, sorry, artificial intelligence, and you mentioned you're not exactly the most competent person uh, to speak about it, but if anyone has any ideas of how that might help, for example, sell this profession not as the conservative backwards profession that it is for a lot of people, in a lot of people's minds, perhaps misguidedly. All right. Thank you, presenters, for the wonderful presentation and everything you've shared. I'm Wamboy from Kenya, and I'll share from an African perspective. The question is mainly is um, the main reason why young people do not have land tenure is because, one, I don't know about other continents, but in Africa, we do value land, and it's one of the signs of property. And it's very hard for somebody who has worked hard for that farm to start saying I'm going to transfer my deeds or tra title deeds to the young person. So what other ways can we empower the young people to be able to afford land? Because even data shows that the price of land will continue to go up. So what other means are there to even ensure that they have enough credit or financial uh, facilities? Or if they need to farm on these farms, what other methodologies do we have to ensure that they still have access to land, they can still generate income from these lands, and they are able to um, still uh, gain revenue and still be able to uh, harvest crops in spite of them not having land tenure? Thank you. In one minute, great. I'm happy to take both those questions in one go. I'll give you one example, one statistic. So in Kenya, 50% of horticultural produce doesn't make it to market because it gets spoiled, yeah? There's a company that within the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development that we're involved with, with FMO, is investing in a company called Soco Fresh, which has come with a solar cooling system to enable that preservation of horticultural produce. Imagine that, 50% more produce making it to market. That doesn't directly equate with a doubling of revenue, but it definitely equates to a significantly larger viable economic potential from the horticulture sector in Kenya. You add to that your processing, your value addition activities. It's an attractive business. It's a really viable money-making opportunity for young people. When you combine that with the digital side, access to information, climate-related data, you de-risk, you make it even more financially viable and even more attractive. Um, I think if I, my statistics is right, 80% of Kenyan land is arid and semi-arid. We haven't used that land. It only needs technology. We need to have dams that reserve water and then land will not be an easy. Israel, a very desert country, produces in a way that helps. You know, governments has to bring about technologies that help to utilize the existing land we have even in Kenya, Ethiopia, and elsewhere in Africa. But that's not the problem of other African countries, like take Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi. These countries have ample land, unutilized land. It's only willingness of the governments to help them to allocate land to the young people. It's communal land, it's not a problem. So I think it depends on the specificity of the countries, but nonetheless, governments should de risk and play a major role to bring about this facilitation for the young people to engage in agriculture. That's why I say the comprehensive support facility mechanism is needed. I'm sure, I'm, I'm happy that I know that the current government in, in uh, Kenya is trying to bring about this comprehensive change. And we are ready, uh, we are also working with them to support uh, this process as AGRA. On behalf of the question to seek clarity, uh, 
in terms of the alternatives? Because you mentioned that the issue is that when you have a farmer who has maybe a seasoned farmer with 30, 40 years of ownership for a particular land, some of the strategies we proposed previously may be untenable in some context where they probably don't want to give up, even if it's a case where it's a leased or paid arrangement, they may have want to hold on to that ownership. So I think she's asking if it might not be feasible to enter in an arrangement with a farmer who doesn't want to release that land. So what else could we do for young people who are also keen, despite the 80% aridity for the I, land that I, exists and is available? I understood the question. Right. There are best practices that has to be emulated. You know, this unutilized, maybe underutilized land by our fathers, uh, older farmers, can be leased to the young people. And there are mechanisms how to do that. Without the intervention of governments, it's difficult to do that. Because it, land is a politics. Land is not only economics. So we need to have that politics right. Otherwise, it's very difficult. So we need to have governments to have policy upon the mass you know, discussions in the country to draft that policy in a proper sense that it, it's not so much a politics. And it's speculative as well. So the land speculation is the one which ham hampers all developments in Africa. So both urban and rural land. We need to have this politics right. And that's why I said political parties, government, parliament, everybody has to involve in making this policy regime right. Thank you so much for that clarification. Well received. And now we move to our third question. I hope I've been counting correctly. Okay, in 30 question, uh, seconds. <laughs> well, at least it's good. I made people laughing. So yes, uh, let's start clocking from right now. And, and thank you very much, Your Excellency. Seems like we are on a similar train of thought. Um, my question was a follow-up to the previous one, and it's directed to Ms. Kroll here. There's, there are some social cultural aspects, and, and uh, His Excellency is aware to this, um, because in the context of mostly, you know, like Africa, there's a social cultural dynamic to that. And as, as we shift towards innovation and, you know, like soilless technology, having come from an input, you know, uh, like bear and having that kind of insight, do you see um, the success of young people shifting more towards a uh, production that is less uh, dependent on access to land? Because in our context, it's not the lack of land, but access to it. So perhaps just given a different dynamic from someone from the outside looking in, what do you see that as the future of young people and how we can embrace that? Thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think the, the statistics are f less than 5% of food relies on land. 95% of food relies on land. Less than 5% doesn't use land. Thank you. I got my math twisted, my words twisted. So I think there's opportunities. Now, when you look at landless food production, let's take aquaculture out. So let's look at crops, which is our business, right? So if you're looking at greenhouses, vertical, th there are trade-offs that are made there, right? And I think there's a solution for the right place. And so when you look at urban environments, I think there's a ton of opportunity there when you're looking at you know, um, vertical farming and those types of things. There's a climate trade-off to that, right? You do have a, a, a controlled environment, so you can have year-round production but what's the intensity of that production. So I think there's possibilities, and I'm inspired by the thinking that's coming forward in competitions like Go Get Us and the other agro-entrepreneurs that we're seeing come forward. And I, I think there's a lot of potential there. I do think that a, the majority of our food will continue to come from land-based production, and we need to do that more regeneratively and in a better way so that it's productive while we're regenerating our soils so that we can produce more so that top soil, soil is still there um, for years to come. Glindis, could I talk about attractiveness of the sector? 20 seconds, thank you. Totally agree with you. I have a colleague that talks about we need to make agriculture sexy again. Um, I think that's a tall order, maybe not as hard as boiling the ocean. Um, but I think about young people talking about agriculture is going to look different. It needs to be profitable. It needs to be a viable 
livelihood, right, to support the family, to have the lifestyle that folks want. And frankly, farming's just not the lifestyle that some people want, but agriculture affords different opportunities and it's gonna look different. And there's options for it to look different in the future, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Can I just grab my 20 seconds as well? Because I think there was an important question. Was it Wamboni? Wamboi, very nice to meet you. Under your question, if I was listening well enough and interpreting it right, I think there's a fear that young people are getting pushed to the bad land far away. It's harder, it's more remote. Who wants to do that? But I'm going to leave with a, a kind of note of optimism here, I hope, or do my best to do so. Where we're making progress within these COPs and a lot of these sort of si similar fora is we're recognizing more than ever that this isn't a, a food pavilion, right? It's a food systems pavilion. Farming, agriculture, it doesn't take place in isolation. And so, Haile Mariam, within the context of the policy framework, what we need to understand is, yeah, if there is that land over there with the technologies making it more viable to farm, let's think about what the other infrastructure is required. Let's think about the schooling. Let's think about the entertainment. Let's think about the wraparound services. And when policy environment takes all of that into account within a systems thinking framework, that's how we'll get there. Thank you. And we have another question. I think that's a final question. Also, oh, well, I won't hold my breath then. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> um, my name is Sophie Healy Thao. I um, run and founded a youth led movement called Act for Food. So please look us up. Um, but my question is actually for um, you. Um, so I was part of the Youth Agricultural Summit that Bayer hosted in 2017, 18, 19, um, and then I think in 2022, but I didn't see one this year, um, which was quite disappointing. And from what I can see on, on your websites and reading your reports, your only streams of youth engagement are um, your science labs and your scholarships. So I'd be really interested to hear what your future plans for youth engagement, because I've heard you speak more broadly about youth engagement in the sector, but does Bayer have a, a youth committee? I see no youth seats on your uh, committees on your website or on your board of directors. Well, first, let me say, I love. I want to talk to you afterwards. So if you're open to that, I would love to have that conversation. The Youth Egg Summit, um, it was a great opportunity, but it was a once and done, right? And so when we look at engagement going forward, we're looking at how we can support ongoing other initiatives. So I want to hear about your organization, right? So these things that have longer and more um, sustained engagement rather than a, a conference that folks come together, which it was a great experience, right? And the capacity building was great. But how do we support youth in a more systemic way is what we're looking at. So we have the Next Gen Ag Impact Network. We're looking at our partnership with WFO Gymnasium, Generation Africa, um, in specific country support for like FFA and 4-H in the United States or youth programs in Brazil. So trying to make this a more sustained engagement rather than a conference, which was a great experience. Um, but we'd love to hear your feedback if we're missing the mark on that. And I stopped. Okay. All right. So thank you so much, audience, for, you know, boosting that level of interaction and our panelists for, uh, you know, providing those responses and clarity. I, I know when we ha initially asked about any questions, I am not going to hold it against you that you didn't have any. I know a lot was shared and I know you're just having that marinate. And so we're winding down at this moment and we're going to invite our final speaker to deliver the closing remarks and I will make her introduction. Laureen Angessa, that's who I'll be calling up. Laureen is 26 years old, living and working in Kenya. She is a climate change and rangeland management specialist with five years working on land governance, tenure security and investment, youth land rights, rangeland management and governance, climate change, food security and livelihood. Currently, she is working with the ILC member Reconcile as a project officer. Laureen is one of the International Land Coalition Africa Youth Ambassadors. She is contributing to youth-centered land governance by advocating for the rights of youth to include 
to include use, access, ownership, and management rights of land. All right, please make Laureen welcome. Uh, the challenge is that you're talking, I'm now talking when everyone is tired. <laughs> but I hope I'll make the best of it. I've been told I only have five minutes, so I think I'll just go straight to the point. First of all, to close the session, we have a few points that were coming in. Of course, the issue of land access and uh, ownership is very critical to the young people, and that is really a discussion that has just come up, and you can listen to all the speakers talk about land tenure, land access, even from the audience themselves. So that becomes really a critical point that we really need to address. And of course, uh, there's issue of uh, what is called, okay, when we, you, young people don't have access to land, what really happens? We will be, when people have access, young people have access to land, we'll be promoting sustainable agriculture. That is really uh, something that, of course, we are having, we are, t we are talking about youth not being, you know, they are not being attracted to the sector. But really, how do we ensure that they really get attracted to the sector? And we have a, one of our speakers said that one thing that the government needs to do is to bear the risk of facilitating young people to engage in agriculture. And how will they do that? They need to have land politics right. And how will that really happen? One of, one of, one, one of the most important things is when drafting policies, they need to support youth and land development. So in every policies that they are, when you are, they are developing policies, they need to have those p policies that really support young people and not, not have, po I mean, review the policies that limits young people getting access to land rights. And uh, of course, we've mentioned something on, you know, policy advocacy is something that is very key to introducing good practices when we are talking about agriculture and sustainable development. So that is something that is really coming up that was really keen. And also, one of the, another thing that is also important is supporting youth leadership and participation in different spaces. We had, uh, of course, a speaker was talking about how they are encouraging youth participation in a number of spaces that are existing. So we ourselves also need to do the same. So when young people are really encouraged to participate in a number of spaces, we have a number of policy spaces that are existing, but their participation in some of those spaces are really limited. So we need to encourage their participation uh, at all times. And also, we need to recognize the role of young people in those spaces. You know, the moment we have them, having them in those spaces is different. But uh, okay, how, when we recognize their role, that becomes another discussion. So having them and recognizing their role is one thing that is really critical that we need to look at. And of course, not forgetting the issue of women land rights. We cannot talk about youth and forget about the women land rights. So we need to also support and promote women land rights and also have the policies that really support women land rights. So I'm being told I have one minute. So there were some very key recommendations that were coming from the International Land Coalition, the meeting that they had with the World Food Forum in consultation with a number of youth. So uh, these are some of the recommendations that were coming up uh, in the consultation that we had. One of them is that young people were calling uh, for land rights. Land rights, just as we have mentioned. And of course, how to achieve that, we need to facilitate youth access to land through land redistribution and rehabilitation programs, and also af having affordable leases. Uh, we were talking about leases being too expensive. How do we have affordable leases to young people? And also, you need to adapt in her inheritance rules that facilitate youth access to land, especially to young women. So we do not want to leave anybody out. And secondly, we need to establish land inheritance processes that are fair, free, and accessible. So those are some of the recommendations that are really coming up. And lastly, we need to advocate for policy reforms that recognize and protect the land rights of indigenous peoples, especially the younger generation. Because the young generations are the future generation. So if we invest in young generations, we invest, we invest in the future. So 30 seconds, I think I, I have just left 30 seconds. So <laughs> I didn't exhaust all my time. So I think I'll stop it from there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Laureen for that excellent roundup. And I mean, she had done the concluding remarks, but I just want to come back to say thank you to everyone for your well-received contributions and insightful points that you raised. Thank you to our audience for your time. It really was a very unique engagement and we do appreciate and hope that, you know, we do what we can to continue to leverage the partnerships. I think that was one of the overarching points in, uh, in all the contributions, partnership for the goals, for the SDG goals it will all translate into what we're trying to achieve here at this time I'm going to ask the panelists to just remain for a brief photo op and then of course encourage everyone else to mix and mingle thank you and have a great evening